Hello everybody and welcome to my quadratic functions video 101. So a quadratic function usually has this form here, uh, ax squared plus bx plus c. The most noticeable or important detail is that we have an x squared somewhere in between. This usually is also expressed with f of x in front of it. This is usually when in math courses we just we first start seeing this. f of x is really the same as putting y equals blah 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 and so don't get tripped up on it. It's just a way to express y. Um, something that is useful though is that if you're going to plug in, for example, 3 for x, uh, you can express that inside here. So if, if I'm going to plug in 3 for x, it's going to look like this. So it's just useful to be more organized and have written somewhere like, hey, I'm plugging in 3 for x. Okay? But f of x is the same as y equals, so don't get confused with that. Now moving on to what a does, what b does, and what c does. So the value of a do, has two primary functions. The first one is it dictates whether the function is facing upward or if it is facing downward. For when it is facing downward, we're going to have an a that is negative, And when it is facing upward, we're going to have an a that is positive. If we have a really big a, for example, a equals 20, our slope or rate of change of the quadratic function is going to be more intensified. So for example, an a of 20 will probably be something like this and an a of negative 35 would be something like that, all right? So that is the two things that a does. First, where, uh, which way it faces, and also how intense or how fast exponential, how fast the quadratic function actually grows. The value of b we will not talk about because honestly it changes the, the graph in, in really funky ways, and I, I don't think it's very necessary at the math level that is, you are probably watching this video for. But if anyone is interested, leave a comment and I can pop out a video on that. C is always, always, always going to be the y-intercept, okay? So if we go over here, and we have, for example, a quadratic function that is like this, you are certified that 100% of the time, this point here, not only is it your y-intercept, it is also your c-value. Okay, and the reason this is how it is, is because if we take the quadratic function uh, form, which is ax squared plus bx plus c, and I go ahead and plug in 0 for x, we're going to see that our first term is going to be multiplied by 0, our second term is also going to be multiplied by 0, and our last term, which is our c, is going to remain unaffected. And so the first two terms are just going to turn into 0 by themselves, and we end up with f of 0 being equal to c. In other words, what we did is we asked the function, hey, if I have an x of 0, what value do I get? And the value that we have to get is the y-intercept, because we're forcing x to be 0. If we force x to be 0, we're looking for a point along this line, which of course has to be the y-intercept, and just by the nature of the function, it has to be the value of c. So that is a really quick way to get the y-intercept in quadratic functions. There's a couple of important terms that you have to keep in mind when facing quadratic functions. The first one that we already talked about is y-intercept. The other one that is also very important is called the vertex, which is kind of like the tip um, of the quadratic function. It is where it changes direction. In this case, it would also be called a maximum. If it were facing a different way, it would be called a minimum. For example, if I were to have uh, this graph here, instead of maximum, this would be called the minimum. However, they are both considered vertex or vertices, I guess would be the right way to put it. They are both vertices, which is either a maximum or a minimum. Okay. The other important language is called the zeros. The zeros are, or of a function, contrary to the y-intercept, are going to be the x-intercepts. So here we would be this point here and this point here. It is also worth noting that in the vertices, we have what is called an axis of symmetry. In other words, a quadratic function is perfectly symmetrical. This is also useful for finding the zeros. If, for example, I know that my axis symmetry is in x equals 2, 
and I have a zero at the point, uh, let's say five comma zero. I know that the distance from my axis of symmetry to the point is three units. And so if I do the same to the other side, I can get the other zero. And so I would have to do two minus three, negative one. And I immediately know that this point here is negative one comma zero. So there I'm combining the knowledge of axis of symmetry with the zeros. The formula for axis of symmetry is the following. It is negative b over 2a. If you plug in negative b over 2a, you will get the value of the axis of symmetry, which in other words will give you an x value, like this one here. Now let's do a quick exercise on how we can get zeros on a quadratic function. So a quick recap, if I were to find the y-intercept here, first of all, I can immediately say that it's just 6 or the point 0, 6. But the proof behind it is that I plug in 0 for x. So if I go, go ahead and plug in 0 for x here, I end up with the first term being gone. So it's 0 squared minus 5 times 0 plus 6. f of 0 equals 6. Okay. And so this is a quick reminder that to get the y-intercept, we plug in 0 for x. If we want to get the x-intercept, we've got to plug in 0 for y and see what happens, right? And so if I, if I go ahead and do that, we end up with the following. The whole thing on the left turns into 0, and we end up with x squared minus 5x plus 6. From here, we have two options. The most common one is called factoring, and the other one is called using the quadratic function, which is this one right here. This one right here is the quadratic function. I personally recommend that you get used to using quadratic function because you can't always factor or factoring isn't always easy and the quadratic function, even though it takes longer, is also more reliable and always works. Here, I can make a video on factoring. I don't wanna make this one too long, but we're gonna end up with x minus two and x minus three. And a very common mistake here is that people say, oh, okay, so my zeros are negative two comma zero and um, negative three comma zero. This would be a mistake. Why is this a mistake? You have to remember that even after factoring, there is still an equals zero over here. And so if I go ahead and put equals zero, you have to ask yourself, what makes this whole thing zero? Because it does, after all, equal zero. Keep in mind that these are two things being multiplied. So if I express this as x and express this as y, if zero equals x times y, either x or y has to be zero, right? And so if we go ahead and literally express that and say, hey, it's either that x minus two is zero or that x minus three is zero. And we solve both of them independently, we end up with x being two or and x being three. And so these are my two points. It's two comma zero and three comma zero. So that is a quick thing on how to get zeros through factoring. To get them through the quadratic function, all you have to do is just plug it into the formula. I strongly suggest that you clearly define what is your A, what is your B, what is your C, and then you plug in just to become more organized. Here we have an A of one because it is one times X squared. B would be negative five and C would be six. So plugging this all into the quadratic formula, it looks like this. Whenever you plug in numbers, you also want to plug in with parentheses to avoid problems with the negatives. When you reach this point, again, you need to branch out on two alternatives because we have a plus or minus over here. We need to say, hey, this is the version where we have five plus one divided by two. And here's the version where we have five minus one divided by two. The one at the top is just going to be 6 over over 2, which is really just 3. And the one at the bottom is going to be 4 over 2, which is just 2. And so here, this would tell me that I have the 0 of 3, comma, 0. And the one below would tell me that we have the 0 of 2, comma, 0. The plus or minus, to see it visually, it might help you, is kind of like here. Here, when we move 3 units to the right, that's the plus, And when we move 3 units to the left, that's the minus. So that is the nature of the plus or minus, at least in visual terms. Last but not least, there's this thing called tangent. 
a tangent is a line that touches another one only at one point and then keeps on moving. For example, if I have something like this, it would touch only at this point and then it would keep on moving forever, never to touch the quadratic function again. This would be called a tangent. And what are tangents useful for? Well, at their vertices, or in this case maximums, we will have a tangent that is completely, completely, completely horizontal. Why is it useful that it's horizontal? You have to ask yourself, what is the slope of this horizontal line? The slope of a horizontal line is simply zero. And so if I go ahead and take a quadratic function, like the example that we had before, and I go ahead and do the derivative of this quadratic function, and I end up with 2x minus 5, and I go ahead and equal this to 0, I am asking the function, hey, when the slope is 0, what is my x? And the slope being 0 is actually this line, this horizontal line that we drew right there, as we prove, as we have proven before. So in this case, if I were to get x alone, I end up with 5 equals 2x. x equals 2.5 because 5 divided by 2. And if I go ahead and graph this, we can double check if that's true or not. If we look at the graph that we have here through decimals of our trusty rusty function, we can see that its maximum, sorry, its minimum or vertice is at the point 2.5 comma negative 0.25. And so the 2.5 is the x value that we were looking for, which is what we got exactly here. And so that is what tangents and also derivatives are useful for in a quadratic function. That being said, I think this is the most useful information for quadratic functions, at least at a 101 level. And that is about it. I hope it helped. Let me know if you want a 101 focused on another topic. And I'll see you on the next one. Peace.